Oh, like uh, at the outset, let me uh, thank uh, Shetil and Eleanor and the university team to invite me today. And I'm so uh, happy about the fact that I'm here and I'll be interacting with you and talking about uh, universal design, learning, and and share some of my perspectives. Uh, some of them have been have been formulated over the years. It has been through trial and error. So as uh, Eleanor rightly pointed out, uh, they would be you would see like a transition from how it was for me to understand this concept of universal design, inclusion, diversity uh, through different lenses, if you will, from starting from being a student with visual impairment uh, and moving on to a lecturer, a uh, public speaker, organizer, a researcher uh, with visual impairment. And finally, I will round it round off the whole uh, all, the entire presentation with uh, uh, some theoretical ideas and concepts. So as you see the, the, the title of this presentation, Universal Design and Individual Insights, a resource-oriented outlook of being a student with visual impairment. And you must be wondering, resource-oriented and impairment? How does that work? Because you know, the, the first thing which you hear is when, when, when you think about impairment, the, the images which evoke in your head is a sense of dependency reduced ability, this limitation-centric idea, the tragic worldview. So what is Kagan going to talk about a resource-oriented outlook? So what, I'm, what my main objective with this first uh, presentation is this, is this flipping the coin. And as I know that uh, many of you are uh, teachers, lecturers, and administrators, I think it will be very nice to understand that how get some perspectives on how a student with impairment sees this whole learning process. Yeah, so uh, as you say, like the, uh, before I go any further, so that you have a bit of a context about where, I, where I'm coming from, uh, this is my biographical profile, previous experiences and educational background. Uh, so as you see, like I have been uh, uh, born and brought up in India. I've lived and worked in the US, Norway and India uh, in the past. Like I'm currently concluding my PhD uh, doctoral fellowship and I have three masters from before, like uh, first in special needs education, second uh, from University of Oslo, second in uh, international social welfare and health policy from Oslo Metropolitan University and the third one from India. And the reason why I have uh, master's in business and administration, the reason why I, ha I have this biographical profile is because you'll understand that I have very eclectic experiences when it comes to understanding the learning environment, when it comes to facing uh, bureaucrats, administrators, teachers from different walks of life and saying, okay, here I, I have to need some accommodation. Could you help me get some accommodation? And how do I go about it? So there has been this constant learning process over the past uh, 10 years or so. And yeah, and I have, as I mentioned, uh, previously worked as a, as a management consultant and um, lecturer, tutor, public speaker. And I will be sharing all those perspectives in the upcoming slide. Does it go through? Yep. Fantastic. Yeah, so these are the critical reflections of being a student with visual impairment. So am I an average student, a normal student, a self-contained student, a student who is independent, who is initiative taking, who is motivated, who is energetic, who is cognitively always stable? You know, and, and the question is that all these are idealized constructs. If you think about it, you know, that when, when you go to a, a classroom as a teacher, as a lecturer, and, you, and your main idea is that who should I be addressing this lecture for? Is there a thing called as average? And a lot of damage in my assessment has been done because of these concepts or these ideas, which, have st which started from, quote unquote, the psychology department back in the day. And it ended up just percolating to different spheres of life, be it the therapeutic side of, or medical side of, uh, of the story, or be it through counselors and experts in, this, in the academic sense. That let us create a classroom for an average student. You, get, you are a perfect average student who is going to be in the center of the class. 
neither too hot nor too cold, right in the center. So I, I think a lot of damage in my assessment when it comes to inclusion of not just person with impairment or student with impairment, but student with different needs. This is also one thing which I want you to take away from this presentation. The idea is go beyond impairment for once and try to understand perhaps my impairment experiences are just something which gives me a distinctive vantage point to talk about diversity and inclusion but this might hold true for people who are from ethnic minority backgrounds it might very well hold true for people who have different language abilities language skills it might hold true for any for, 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 for women who come from perhaps if it's a male oriented stream like engineering or physics and you somehow find a woman there all of these questions, you know, all of these concepts come, will, uh, will start haunting. So that's why it's very important to not have this idealized construction of an, an individual, but to have a much, much broader, lucid, fluid understanding of an individual. That individual evolves, individual learns, individual is a trial and error. You, are, you, have, you have some uh, capacity today, but tomorrow you learn a different skill and you are at a different level. So, and this othering process is very, very crucial. As I mentioned, these are all binary constructs. Often we do it because we want to categorize our, our uh, life. It's easier to have a, uh, put people into categories, give them labels. Ah, this person is out of the ordinary, gifted child, gifted student, excellent. And this person is just average. Or this person requires, it's, too dependent and too needy is, is there's some something abnormal something not right about him or her and, and this other persons are normal our students are normal so it's very very crucial to keep this in the back of mind when when you're designing the classrooms if you will yeah so as i was just talking the perfect example here is an individual a girl or a, or a woman uh, uh, she could be accomplished but again she has to be average in, in many ways you know not uh, not express way too much or an average face she carries the average weight of the world on her average shaped shoulders she she wears the average shoes not make too much noise no, does not want to stand out you see so as i said the point of this presentation should be like a point of departure wherein the conversation should start from perhaps uh, impairment but should not end at impairment it has to be much more inclusive and that's where universal design kicks in yeah so again a normal student like yes of course i can take a lot of stress i am a i'm a i can write those essays all night long and then submit them in the morning and then sleep and i'm coffee addict and where's my cup of coffee it's here right normal student ah, is this a myth or reality you have to ask that question few challenges as i mentioned like so again from my standpoint these are some of the major major challenges this whole expectation that i have to fit in and this this perpetual sense of anxiety that ah if i stand out what will what will the group think of me what will the class think of me? What does the what does this teacher think of me? If I ask, a, can I can I take a little bit more time because I don't see? For instance, the concept of power distance so crucial. Like again, as I mentioned, I have this very di diverse uh, background. So, if you come from a culture like India, when the power distance is so phenomenally huge. The huge hierarchical structures. Before you write, hi, Shetil, you'll have to say, uh, Hel dear, uh, Mr. Sir, Doctor, respected Shetil. <laughs> exactly. So it's a, it's 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 a nice nice ego massage which you have to do before you reach to the point that could you come or could I come to your office. So that, and the moment you come to Norway, and which is a pretty egalitarian society, and you're like, oh yeah, like, can we go out for a coffee? Hello? And then the answer is yes, of course we can go out for coffee. And you can ask the professors and so on. And so the point is this, that it's, it, it's so crucial 
for the teachers, lecturers, because we are talking about multicultural classroom settings. We are not talking about the homogeneous Nordic model that most of the students in a class in Norway would be ethnic Norwegians. They might be, they might not be. And if they are not, then how do we go about understanding these things? Perhaps we might have to signal to the, the students who are coming from outside Nordic countries, outside Europe, outside the rich developed world, that listen, it's okay, you don't have to be that formal. It's okay. So it's very, very crucial. Again, the next point is about this being circumspect. Think about this, that it's very hard to be a student in general. And it's twice as hard to be a student, I think, with an impairment. You will you'll encounter the question like, do I have a voice? Can I protest? Can I just say, uh, can I raise my hand and say whatever I want to say? Again, these are very culturally sensitive ideas. In some cultures, it's seemed, it, it seems okay to do it in the US, in the UK perhaps, it's okay. But in Norway, if you're just standing too much out of the group, if you're being too bold to challenge the professor, I don't know like how, does, how do professors react to it. In India, it might be unthinkable, for instance. So again, and the students often grapple with this question about like, okay, how do I get accommodation? There's a lot of dearth of information about that. It's not sometimes accessible, it's not easy to go to the website and click and say, oh yes, here is the link, here are the resources, and ah, oh, I, I finally found out. So it's very, very important to tackle that aspect as well, because if the students don't get the confidence, then they will never approach. And if they don't approach, most of them will drop out. And that's what the evidence also shows, that often students with impairment or students who have a little bit of hassle in the first semester, or perhaps second semester, early days, they just drop out. They say, this is not for me. I'm perhaps too stupid to participate in the classroom. And again, like one thing which really struck me is the last point, if you think that this is this peculiar predicament, you know, that we, if you have an impairment, then you, know, you should have to be eternally grateful and perpetually happy, you know, and, and nod and smile and just, uh, just be this pleasant person all time. And this is a very, very huge uh, challenge. Because sometimes you don't want to, if you have a mental health problem, you don't want to be happy all the time. You just don't. So if, if a student approaches you or is too shy to approach you, then as a lecturer, as a teacher, as a professor, uh, or as an administrator, you have to be cognizant of these aspects. Imagine if you are an administrator and a student comes to you and says, okay, I need, I need a bit of, uh, just think the amount of psychological effort the student has made to, to say, okay, I have a problem, I have to go and talk about it. Quote, unquote, impairment disclosure. That's a huge problem. Because they don't want to stand out. Again, it boils down to the whole point about not standing out, the students. It encapsulates this pic the picture. Don't want to be a loner, don't want to stand, don't want to be an outcast. Just want to be accepted the way I am. Power distance, as I was just saying. If you think about like what, how I was feeling when I was talking to some of the professors, it, it, was, it was almost in India, this worship-like quality. Oh, here is this professor and uh, he or she has this degree and worked for 20 years and uh, whatever he or she says, I've got to listen to him or her. There's no way I question that authority. There is there's compliance. And on the other side, like I'm having dinner with uh, rector, president of the university, Kurt Rice. And he's saying, yes, I would like to listen to what you have to think about things. There's this huge transition. If you see, again, on one side, you want to be prudently quiet or silent because you don't want too much trouble. You want to be played safe. So you voluntarily say, okay, I'm going to just keep quiet. I'm going to seal my lips. And on the other side, you say, no, 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 I would like to uh, fight against 
this is what happened to me like uh, five years ago. There was this huge campaign in Norway to implement tuition fees for students who were coming from outside EU. And I said that that is kind of a bit of uh, um, classist way of looking at educational system. Essentially what you're saying is that Norwegian lack of tuition fees is only that, that that aspect is only acceptable for or it's only allowed for students who are coming from Europe or the rich countries because if you ask a student who's coming from Africa Latin America South Asia or some other parts of the world less privileged parts of the world they might not be able to afford to pay the tuition fees and on top of that pay the expenses it's already pretty hard and difficult expensive to live in Norway so there was this huge camp in which we had again and again I was just a part of it but the fact that I got an opportunity to be a part of it is something which is important and this is what makes for instance for an assertive clear-headed well articulated individual so what are the opportunities as I said like I started this whole presentation with the idea of resource orientedness and what is meant by resource orientedness as I mentioned that this whole the moment you have a disability or, a, or an impairment or you are not the quote unquote norm and what do I mean by norm norm is perhaps in a in a Berkeley isk setting it will be white male privileged middle class heteronormative individual well-functioning individual I don't know if the, that norm exists in Norway I don't know but I'm saying that if it does exist then how do we tackle it a you start with the idea of being an expert like who knows more about my impairment me or you can I understand about my impairment? Can I communicate my needs, my expectations? Can I explain to Eleanor and Shetil what uh, uh, it'll be easier for me if Eleanor, can you come outside and collect me from there instead of me trying to find the building door for half an hour? Can I do that? Yes, and it's my it's it's incumbent on me to do that. It's not Eleanor's responsibility to ask me about that. So that's why playing the expert role, you have to play the expert role for yourself, for your rights, for your, for your inclusion or exclusion, whatever you want to have it. Next one, which I mentioned about this whole identity issue. Am I a disabled student? Am I a, a, an African-American student? Am I, a, am I a student, Indian student? Am I a Norwegian student? Or, or am I a student who happens to come from Norway, who happens to come from India, who happens to have an impairment? Or who happens to be an African American? This is a huge fundamental question. How, what kind of identity marker I associate with? Because if I say I'm a student with impairment, then, I, then I'm signaling, I'm, I'm accepting, I'm acknowledging, and I'm promoting the idea that no, I have impairment, but there are perhaps some more qualities which might be interesting for you. You might find it important to learn from, or we could talk about it very very crucial this question of identity if you if you check some one of the most important points on this slide is this is the idea of for instance building allies through you do open communication you talk to your peers you exchange ideas you explain to them this is my impairment this is how I would like to you to uh, address me if you meet me if you see me on the street don't just run away you know if you if I don't call your uh, if I don't recognize you the next day, don't be offended. That Kagan did not see me. He was seeing at me, but he never said hi. Super rude individual. Like, again, all of these misunderstanding, this challenging the normative assumptions could take place only through open communication. And then you build allies. Because you've got to give a sense. Again, it's from my understanding, a bit of benefit of the doubt to the system, to the people. You cannot be in perpetual state of confrontation and uh, as a student, raising, uh, raising proverbially hell, you know, protesting all the time, demanding all the time. You've got to understand that 
I can play my part as best as I can in the ecosystem which is given to me, the learning environment ecosystem. And I hope that it will be reciprocated by the teachers. You give that, you have a, an exchange through that sense of goodwill. And you use disabled, disability service providers or support service providers as agents to liaison between between your needs, your expectations, your demands, and what teacher can or lecturer can offer. Very, very crucial. So, what, what, what was I talking in the essence? It's pretty, pretty simple. The three things. I call it the ROA rule, the taking responsibility, accepting ownership, and building allies. As a student, if you can do that, it doesn't matter if you're an impaired student, not an impaired student, you, you, can, you can at least make an effort to, to take a step, a formidable step forward, and then you could use your experiential insights, as I say in the end, with this whole idea of talking about diversity, inclusion, and universal design. I will not, as you, as you, as you might, have, might have understood, I did not talk too much about universal design, because you have been... Un I'm sure Shetil, Hawken, Eleanor, and the whole team has drilled the idea of universal design and learning environments into your head by now. My idea was to just give a point or give a perspective which you might have thought about, but you might not have heard it articulated in a way I'm doing it. And as I said, for instance, like we are entering a phase wherein uh, classrooms are becoming more diverse, it's becoming more multicultural. Societies are, uh, are, are more inclusive, want to be more inclusive. And so if you want, want to be professionals like teachers, lecturers, professors, administrators, we better know about these things. And we could use the catalyst of universal design uh, uh, to create a much more holistic, wholesome, and inclusive learning environment. Thank you. And let's have some questions and discussions. Really looking forward to it.